So, um, how to become a seasoned IT security professional? This is one of the questions I get asked many times when uh, people ask me what my job is. Um, when I'm asked, I usually uh, respond something along the lines, hey man, I hack banks for a living. That's kind of cool. And um, the next step, usually, is, uh, oh man, but how, how do you get started? So what are the first steps on the way of the samurai? So how do you um, start as, okay, I have a general background on IT, uh, so how to start pursuing a career in uh, IT security. So in this next uh, 40 minutes, I will try to talk about the challenges presented uh, in this regard, and I will tell you a whole bunch of things. But uh, these things are basically my opinion, so please feel free to agree or disagree with me. I'm more than happy to discuss my views with anyone else who uh, comes to me. And the first thing here, the first lesson is that one a master said once that don't believe anyone anything. So that also applies to this talk. So please apply a grain of salt to whatever I say and whatever you'll be hearing or thinking. Okay, so let me tell you a little story first. We are in uh, 1834 in France which is the most developed, one of the most developed countries at the time. And um, they have a whole bunch of big cities. They have a lively commercial life. Um, and the capital is Paris, as we know it. And this, the, other store, the other place where this story takes place is the picturesque town of Bordeaux near the Atlantic Ocean. Bordeaux is a huge commercial crossroad at the time, so uh, there are many ships coming and going, and there is a stock exchange which is used to transfer and sell and buy goods which comes with those ships. In order to uh, communicate with the uh, military outpost in Bordeaux, there is a um, certain communication network between Paris and the major cities of France, um, as in Bordeaux. So this communication network was the, uh, was like cutting edge technology at the time. So we are talking about the early 19th century. And the way this communication network worked is uh, what they call uh, optical telegraph poles. So as you can see, those are those um, things on the top of this tower. In uh, the early 18th century, um, this was the um, the most. This, this was the top of this technology in France. They started to deploy these devices all over France uh, in the beginning of the 18th century, the 19th century. Sorry, um, and they had like 1,500 of these all over France. How did these work? So if you look at the picture, you see that there are these rods on the top of this building, and these rods could be turned into various positions, depending on the signal they want to transmit. And um, the way this, this was like a one single outpost, and there was like a network of these. The way they worked, imagine that someone from Paris tries to transmit a signal to Bordeaux, uh, they have the first outpost near Paris. They set up their control rods according to the signal. And the neighboring station, which was in eyesight of the previous one, they just used a good pair of binoculars. And the next um, station manager just adjusts the rod on their uh, outpost just like they saw on the previous one. So this went on uh, all the way to Bordeaux. And uh, this was quite cool at the time. According to um, transcripts, in good conditions, like when there was like good visibility, a signal could reach 500 kilometers an hour um, from Paris to Bordeaux. This is like uh, this uh, means that it was possible to get a signal from one end of the country to the other in just one hour, which is kind of cool. We are talking about 18th, uh, 19th century. So the most 
widespread way of transporting information was using couriers and messengers at the time. This was quite cool. How did the protocol work? So in order to uh, introduce some kind of error protection in the protocol implemented by these uh, tel optical tra telegraph poles, there was a station in uh, the town of Tours, uh, somewhere between, uh, it's around halfway between Paris and Bordeaux. And there was, um, there was a guy in that control tower who had uh, a code book which allowed him to actually decipher the message, the signal that was being transferred. Uh, this was like a privileged thing as normal um, telegraph operators did not have a clue about what kind of signals they are transmitting. So it was possible to introduce some kind of error protection there. So this meant that the station manager in two uh, checked whether the signal made sense and if it did, he just trans continued the transmission to the other end of the country. Otherwise, he sent a message back the line saying that, please repeat the signal because this makes no sense. So this was, this was kind of cool. And uh, this was, as I said, cutting edge technology at the time. This was used, a similar system was used in also in Britain and also in the Russian Empire, which, uh, which was kind of interesting. All right. So um, the signal chain used two kinds of signals. One signal was for like normal information transform uh, thing. So this meant that um, the control roads were adjusted to positions, and what that signal meant was known according was deciphered based on a code book uh, which was in Paris and also in the outposts in Bordeaux. And as I said, the station manager, the tool uh, station also had that code book with him, but no, no one else did it. Besides these normal signals, there were also control signal, control uh, signals, which was like the meta characters in this protocol. This meant that should be an error uh, in the transmission. Should there will should there be an operator error in the transmitted message, the um, the control signals were used to signal that please repeat the transmission or do something else according to what the problem was. This was, as we see, the nuclear weapon uh, of the telecommunications at the time, but. As we see, uh, an operation of uh, 1,800 um, telegraph poles with officials and, and shifts and that kind of stuff was quite expensive. As a result, uh, these telecommunication systems was reserved for government use and government use and military use only. So civilians were not able to, not allowed to actually use this network. So they were still relying on messengers and couriers. All right, so we have this communication, telecommunications network. We see the protocol, we see the infrastructure, and this was the infrastructure which was affected by the first uh, recorded attempt on cyber attack. And as we call, as I think we would call it, the signal chain piggybacking kind of thing. But we'll see how that worked later on. So we have two people two brothers in the picturesque town of Bordeaux. They were called, uh, in, sorry for my lousy French, uh, François and uh, maybe Joseph Plan. They were two stock clerksmen at the Bordeaux Stock Exchange. And they wanted to make money. And they actually came up with a brilliant idea how to uh, abuse this optical telegraph systems for their purpose. So what they plan was that they had a colleague in the Paris Stock Exchange, um, which was the center of all the stock exchanges all over France. So whatever happened in the Paris Stock Exchange had a significant effect on everywhere else. So this meant that uh, the brothers asked this person uh, to communicate the movements of the Paris Stock Exchange to a bribed uh, telegraph operator after tour. So this meant that the colleague sent uh, messengers to these tour telegram operators uh, literally after every significant move of the stock exchange. 
and this bright telegraph operator introduced a false signal in the signal flow. This meant that he, um, inc he included a custom signal, which uh, had no meaning in its original context, but had meaning uh, for the brothers in Bordeaux. And subsequently, uh, of course, this signal broke the official, uh, the original communication flow. And uh, in order to correct his mistake, he introduced a, oops, sorry, I screwed up, operator error, please ignore the last signal signal after the introduced one. And these two signals went all the line to Bordeaux. And since the uh, fixed signals were only recorded, this entire attack went out of the books. So no one really understood what was going on. But um, the inserted signal actually made sense to the people in Bordeaux who were who had keen eyes on uh, false signals. So what does this mean? Um, we have uh, the distance of Paris to Bordeaux around 600 kilometers, uh, and the distance between Paris and Tours 230 kilometers. This meant that uh, a good 400 kilometers was shortcut using this uh, method. This meant that uh, the telegraph, or due to this telegraph operator hack, uh, the brothers were able to uh, get notified about the Paris Stock Exchange movements days before everyone else, which is kind of cool. And they make they made a whole bunch of money using this thing. The, the plan worked, and they've been using the telegraph network for almost two years um, in in the 1830s using this method. So they were quite successful. Uh, of course, in the end, they were caught uh, because um, the bright telegraph operator was sick, uh, called in sick, and he tried to uh, notify the other guy who uh, substitute him about this um, in incorrect use of the signaling protocol, and that other uh, that other person reported them. So the Blunt brothers were caught, but interestingly, they were put on a trial, and. Uh, Laws in France at the time did not make uh, custom, uh, proprietary use of the optical telegraph network illegal. So, uh, as it turned out, uh, they were condemned. But since having no laws against this kind of activity, uh, they were only asked to uh, pay the cost of the trial. So they went home scot-free. And also, they were the first hackers in human recorded history who abused a telecommunications network for their own purposes, which is kind of cool, I think. So um, I love this story because uh, it illustrates a very important uh, point with hackers and hacker mentality. And that's, um, that's what the point of this talk is. Uh, of course, I'm trying to ignore ethical concerns here. Uh, for a moment and focus only on the mechanism and the underlying philosophy, what they followed. So, um, firstly, we are talking about two dudes who uh, had a general understanding how the optical telegraph networks worked. And they also knew about this signaling protocol. They realized how they can uh, use the human element to abuse this protocol for their own good. And they they did. They actually uh, did it quite well. And the second thing which I find really appealing in this uh, in this cyber attack, let's call it that, is that uh, the the whole thing went unnoticed because the uh, the log protocol ignored wrong signals. So that's that's cool because uh, log entries were free of their introdu introduced signals, and that's that's kind of cool. So any backspaced message was absent from the logs. So let's talk about mentality here. Uh, being a hacker, I think, uh, in my opinion, it means a certain type of mental approach. It's a unique point of view. Um, to me, hackers are the most curious species uh, of the world. They try to understand how things, how things work and how they can use things for something that the inventor of those things would have never dreamed about. Um, they try to understand everything they can, as as I think uh, everyone 
shares this, so everyone wants to understand the world around them. This, this might sound quite philosophical, but it will get very practical. Uh, how many of you have tried uh, to use desktop Linux at one point or another? Just raise your hand, show hands. Cool. Uh, I think almost half of the audience has tried that. So um, I've been using desktop Ubuntu in one form or another for for almost five years. And um, this meant that I had a whole bunch of problems all along the way, like unprecedented challenges anytime, anywhere. There's no guarantee that anything will work at any point, which... Um, it is really hard to explain to anyone why this actually makes any sense because what they see that you are struggling with your computer all the time and that damn thing doesn't work. And when it breaks down, it breaks down at the worst possible time. So um, I really enjoyed those times because I, at some point, I understood how the thing worked and uh, I could fix it whenever it went wrong. And there's one thing I never had in associate in uh, in association with my computer that is fear i was never afraid that what the hell will go wrong with that thing because if it went wrong i knew how to fix it if it uh, went wrong really well um you know you had that feeling when you trying to install some new features new kernel maybe and you will sit at the end of the day, in a couple of hours, you will sit in front of a blinking grub rescue shell in front of your computer trying to make the thing work again. And I'm pretty sure uh, anyone who has tried to use desktop Linux has that experience and knows how to rescue his machine or how to reinstall, for that matter, really quickly. So uh, that's, that's really cool because it takes... Um, a critical element into the picture that is understanding. So if uh, if I understand how the computer works, I will stop being a mere consumer of that computer and mere consumer of IT. So this is uh, this what this means is that I understand how those things work and I know how to fix them when they go wrong. And I think this was the the ancient meaning of the word hacker before the whole cybersecurity Kevin Metnick thing came around. Uh, so these are the dudes who um, take whatever they have in their garden sheds and build something of those things. That's uh, that's a really nice way of looking at the world, having uh, having a whole bunch of opportunities around us. All right, and the next. Next question, which comes to mind, how to um, how to become one, how to become the one, how to uh, start this whole thing. So first and foremost, I think uh, to me, being being a hacker is having a unique point of view, a unique perspective of the world. So it's really interesting to talk and walk around in the city, for instance, with a, with a couple of penetration tester dudes. Uh, I did it many times, and we made fun of ourselves by talking about what we look, when, what we see when we look around. Um, for instance, in, in one case, we want to, uh, to have lunch with a client, and as we were walking from the office to the place where we had lunch, uh, it was in, in Zurich, it was in Switzerland, and uh, the place uh, was near the uh, near, near the main train station and there were literally thousands of bicycles attached to uh, these bicycle storage areas um, near that station and as we all were like keen bicyclists uh, we were looking at the bikes and it's like, oh man that's that's really cool that's really cool and as it turned out uh, that guy the client was looking at the bikes themselves and the pen testing team was looking at how those bikes were locked. So they were looking at the locks, not the bikes themselves, which is really funny because we're looking at the same thing, but we were focusing on completely different aspects. So this uh, basically is a kind of um, curiousness about the world around me, and it's really, really interesting to see the world uh, this way. So one of the first lessons I learned when... Uh, when trying to work as a penetration tester and walking around in different uh, areas and different companies was that um, many times hackers don't have to do anything with IT. 
So this means that um, even though even though most of the the hacking type activities is is associated with uh, IT security and probably by financial gain and defacing websites and all this kind of stuff. Uh, many of these hackers are not working in IT security. They, they just work somewhere else. For instance, when I was uh, working in London, I met a girl, and um, she was uh, an investigative journalist from Denmark. And as it turned out, um, her thesis was to arrange a face-to-face -face interview with uh, Denmark's most wanted drug lords at the time. And uh, he was uh, on the run, he was being on the run from the police when she arranged that interview with the guy. And it was really interesting because as she uh, told me how she get there, how she get that person uh, to for, for an interview, uh, it turned out that she was pursuing, uh, the, driven by the same motives as I was, even though she was not, she had nothing to do with uh, IT security. And... Um, she had this tendency of uh, talking her way out of everything, every every tight situation, every tight corner. Um, that was really funny because uh, after we met, she actually applied for a pen tester company, and she became the social engineer expert. So this is kind of cool. And as I heard, um, she happened to be one of the best. All right, so. Um, the next step and the next lesson is uh, is how to learn this kind of um, approach to the world. So, IT security and hacking is as huge as the world, as the rest of the world, as everything can be hacked at some point or will be at some point. Therefore, it is impossible to say that um, anyone is an expert on anything. I talked to a lot of guys who were really cool in one field or another. But there is, but none of them called themselves an expert, even though, uh, even though they were really good in those things, but they just didn't call themselves an expert. So, um, in order to get started, I think there is a couple of fields which, uh, need to be learned when, uh, trying to pursue a career in IT security. Uh, I will talk about those a um, bit more on that later. And the gimmick is that many t more often than not, um, by the end of the day, we will have a better understanding of uh, the technology or that particular system than those guys who actually built that system. And that especially is uh, true for penetration testing and system testing assignments where developers, operators, uh, SOC guys, they have huge blind spots. So there are areas which they don't know about, but we do because we go and we went there and tested the whole thing. So this means that by the end of the day, we will have a clearer picture about what they see um, than actually they do. And this, this might lead to really funny um, situations. Um, for instance, in one occasion, I had a job when I had to test uh, an iOS application, and um, well, it was it was a pile of crap from a crypto point of view, and we sent the whole thing back to uh, the developer guys, and they f did a quick fix on the problems, but it was buggy, and um, it was us who helped them debug their code, even though we didn't have their code. But we could have them because we had the uh, entire thing going on in IDA Pro and so what's going on. Okay, um, and a thing and an idea of uh, a note on learning, which is uh, this caused me quite a bit of a headache when when I got started. So this means that learning is not a theory thing. So you have to do it in practice. Whatever you learn, try to do it in practice. So there is a difference between theoretically having knowledge about something and uh, struggling your way through that particular attack or building up that particular environment. So this means that uh, in order to s replicate any kind of attack, you have to fight your way through uh, the whole thing. Like you have to uh, build up the environment learn how that thing worked, how to configure those things. Uh, more, more often than not, you will have to dig in manuals and anything that 
uh, allows you to build that environment which the attack will live in. And this um, this will result in a quite deep knowledge about that uh, particular area. This this can be even a piece of architecture, uh, a piece of infrastructure, an operating system, a database manager, or whatever. That doesn't really matter what it is. Um, there are a couple of things which uh, which which are essential. For instance, uh, how networks work and how networking works. That's that's one of the key areas which need, which no matter what you do, uh, no matter what your field of interest is, you have to know how networks work. Also, there's a really need, uh, there's a really deep need for understanding how operating systems work, and this is the point where having a desktop Linux around gives a really um, a significant advantage on anyone who has struggled their way through uh, trying to live with a desktop Linux. Also, um, there's a there's a question that pops to mind: where are where is this all learn, uh, taught? Which school should I take? I think um, that's not the question of which school to take. I think it's the question of uh, how to approach IT and IT security in general. So there are places where you can actually learn stuff. And these these are like certificates, certifications, which which can be handy sometimes. So um, in my opinion, there are two kinds of uh, certs. One gets you through HR. And that's it. they are really, they, they come with really thick books. You have to learn those books, tick some boxes on an exam. And you, if you have it, um, your H, uh, your CV will be put on the top of the pile by HR people. Um, other certs, however, uh, they actually, uh, give you the opportunity to struggle, which, uh, which is another way of saying they give you knowledge, but I prefer the saying that you have to struggle your way through the, um, through the exam and through um, the syllabus all the time. There is um, a common misconception about certifications. Um, like many my many of my friends say that oh man these oh dude these are really expensive things and um, my employer won't pay for them. Uh, well, um, I think if you're interested and you want to pursue your career, um, you probably should purchase. Those certs for yourself, pay for yourself. I, uh, for my end, um, virtually I think all of my certificates were paid by myself. So um, when I was between jobs, I said, "Okay, I will spare a month or two for my certification," and spent most of my time trying to learn and um, fight my way through the exam. And that was kind of cool. I think this this kind of works because I had to I had time to digest the materials and to learn how to actually fight my way through the exam. Um, but this, that's not a necessity. Um, something that is for free, but it only costs some time, is uh, watching conference talks. Um, when I was uh, at my first workplace, I spent literally hours uh, every week watch, just watching security conferences and watching talks of um, much smarter people than me. And that also, that gave me a whole bunch of ideas. For instance, I learned uh, many things, many fields that I never knew that even existed. And I had the keywords to Google them and the tools to start playing around with. But uh, at the end of the day, what this gave to me was a uh, general understanding what is interesting for me. Um, so I was really interested in everything that is invisible. So I was interested in uh, hacking radio networks, uh, playing around with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, that kind of stuff. And um, I was, I'm was i really grateful to those guys who did the hard work and the research for me. And I only uh, needed to, to stand on their shoulders. Okay, um, but this is all still theory. Uh, in order to get things into practice, is um, Mm, is CTF games this capture the flag competitions, which are one of the easiest and most popular way of uh, trying your claws on actual infrastructure and actual applications. 
Um, these city of games uh, provide you with a safe environment to to try. That's that's kind of cool. Um, many of these city of games uh, are associated with uh, different security conferences, but many of those are available uh, all year long. Like there, there's an aggregator site for these. Like I think it's whitechild.net. That's the that's the name of the site, but there is a whole bunch of those. Just Google them. Uh, many of those give you a VPN connection. If you want to try to hack Windows boxes, Linux boxes, they have a whole bunch of those lying around, and um, you can try your favorite tools on them. Also, um, alternatively, you can go and create your own test labs, which uh, will be a necessity at some point or another. Uh, but thankfully, uh, VMware VirtualBox and all this virtualization software is for free. So there is no problem investing in some boxes and popping them. Um, should you be interested in mobile application hacking um, and um, hacking Android or iOS applications in general, um, um, there is a way of installing a custom ROM on your phone if you uh, have an Android, if you're an Android user. This will also introduce you to a whole new level of challenges when it comes to struggling with your infrastructure. So <laughs> I recall that um, I was running CyanogenMod mod on my Galaxy, and oh, I think we had some some vacation in, in, uh, in the Canary Islands, and we were cycling around a lot. And... As I recall, I try, I was trying a new kernel on my Galaxy, but uh, as it turned out, um, it started overheating the phone. So while I was like making pictures and uh, cycling around in Gran Canaria, I had, I, I had to touch my phone every 30, 35 seconds to say, is it hot? Is it hot? No, 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 no. And as it turned out that yes, this is the overheating problem with the kernel. Uh, I had to do an Android uh, backup restore while I was still cycling. Um, I don't recommend anyone to do that because that's obviously cut your um, potential to use your phone. But it's a great way to learn how Android works. And it's a great way to learn how to uh, fix Android when it breaks. But that's kind of cool. And there's this thing called, uh, it's not my term, I'm pretty sure many of you have heard it, it's called try harder. And this means, um, this is this is an approach, the willingness to struggle, to try harder. I think um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a brilliant Hungarian word for, for this, it is called sivash. Uh, I, I asked a couple of uh, native English speakers, say that what, what, how do you translate this into English? And as it turned out, there is hardly an, uh, an equivalent for this word in English. The closest thing you can get is struggling, for which expresses the the uh, minuscule scale of results compared to the efforts you had to put in. So, um, a little story for this. Um, when, when I was tasked to gear up and train a mobile penetration testing team for one of the uh, pen test companies here in Hungary, I was like super excited. And I made, uh, and I said uh, that I will make a whole bunch of really hard challenges for those guys. And I made a couple of dozen uh, applications which were uh, of uh, varying uh, difficulty, but the point was to hack them. And as it turned out, uh, I gave them to the guys, and as it turned out that they had uh, problems. Of course they had problems, because they knew they didn't know anything. So I gave them books. Um, they still came back to me that, oh, hey, we, we can't do this, it's, it's too hard. Uh, I started to uh, give them more books, more talks. I showed them how to fix those, how to hack those applications. And and if they, uh, it took time. It took a lot of time and effort. But eventually, they get the, got the hang of it. So they they uh, started to be better and better. And I think um, by the end of the training process, they were really good. And and I thought, well, well, um, I could maybe I could do a little shortcut on this process. So I started uh, writing tutorials for those 
for the most crucial steps. And I thought that, okay, these uh, tutorials will make things much easier and much quicker to learn. But um, as it turned out, it didn't. Because the guys, uh, the new rookies who were the juniors at the time, uh, they were following my tutorials, but still were not able to replicate those steps in real applications when they had to tweak things around a bit. So as it turned out, um, I came to the com conclusion that the struggling bit is inevitable. So the more you struggle, uh, the more it is uh, possible for you to learn whatever it takes to hack an application. And this bit, I think, unfortunately, it's inevitable, but I'm happy to uh, discuss uh, the question from a, from a tutorial point of view. So the conclusion is that you have to have to try harder. So... Um, when asked what the most important uh, question, the most important skill of a pen tester or a wannabe penetration tester is, is um, this thing, the willingness to try harder and to struggle their way through the uh, process. Okay, so as I said, uh, what kind of IT degree or degree for that matter you uh, make, it's kind of irrelevant. So the whole thing is that uh, you have to be uh, just simply interested in, in what you want to do and have this mindset to the willing to struggle. And that's what the most important thing is, not the school where you, your diploma is from. Also, it's, uh, it's also a team effort. So... The hackers uh, are famous for for the community approach, so it's not a single player game. Um, virtually every pen testing team I worked for had a really cool tester team, and we built a nice environment around us. And um, this made a pleasant and um, livable working condition. But it's it all boils down to um, to being in a team. Also, a couple of quick advices. It's uh, completely okay to fail. The willingness to struggle also means that you will fail a lot, many, many times. You have to start over and over again. Um, and when uh, when I interviewed people who wanted to be on my team, the uh, the question I usually asked those guys was that, okay, so how do you um, take struggling? So what was the most difficult thing you tried and failed? And depending on how they answered and what they answered, I kind of get a, get a, get a general view of how that person um, tackles struggling with the uh, problems and how to um, use those skills on the team. Well, um, we are nearing the end, and it's necessary to talk about um, the topic that largely concerns ethical hacking. In our case, being ethical basically uh, boils down to this statement, don't be an idiot. So in many cases, um, when someone tries to pursue an IT security career and tries to learn to, to hack, um, we see a pattern. Said, so, okay, you know how to use SQL map, you know how to use Burp, you know how to uh, do web application assessment on whatever application you want. And you start looking around on the internet because um, it's so huge and so full of shit applications. So um, the thing, the, the main advice here is don't. Don't do this. Because uh, it's more often than not you will get caught and eventually you will get caught and you will face serious problems. Um, as we are in Hungary now, I think I don't have to um, remind you of a recent couple of recent stories about wannabe hackers who um, wanted to get jobs with uh, major IT, a major internet provider in Hungary, but they did it did it in a really really stupid way. So don't. Um, this is what I called like a hobby freedom fighter type thing. So this means that uh, you're looking for vulnerabilities. You try to you believe that you're trying to make the world a better place, even if you do. Um, you find something, you report those problems to the owners of the website, and no one gives a shit. 
you get frustrated, you get angry. You send the uh, vulnerability disclosure letter again to different email addresses, addresses. Even if they respond, they write you back that they don't care. You get frustrated and you go say, oh, fuck you guys, I go full disclosure. And you post your finding on some um, blog post or wherever you want. Well, this is the single easiest way to go to jail. And um, I advise, I highly advise anyone against doing this type of things. If you want to try your claws, uh, go go and do CTF games. And uh, and that's that gives you safe environments where you can uh, try your luck and try your skills and improve them. Thank you very much. And that was all. So any questions or do we have some more time? We have some t we still have time for a couple of questions or arguments or anything that comes to your mind. Does anybody have a question for Jumbo? Hi, uh, my name is Peter Andway and I am an, uh, a pen tester at work and I would like to ask you if uh, you think or can you agree with the better translation and the philosophy between the try harder, it may be in Hungarian, uh, now it fell. So it's very important not to give up after the first few or 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 more hours of uh, hours of uh, you know sivash. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Um, so the thing is that uh, these now families don't give up. So um, you know everyone has who who f has faced challenges at one point or another. Uh, get to the point. I'll oh, screw you guys. I'm going home. I live this shit. I don't care. But uh, but many of us will eventually come back. When we don't give up. So that's, yeah, I agree. That's a good, good translation. Anybody else? Then in that case, please say thank you to Jumbo for that presentation. Thank you.